Hi, everybody. This is Dan. And this is Ron. And this is a nominee. And today we're talking about Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which... Uh, Pee Wee! Pee Wee. Yeah, I have not watched this since I was... Um, I want to say Pee Wee's age, but I know it's not. I'm Pee Wee's age about now. <laughs> but... Um, Oh well, do you want to, oh, what a sorry. movie yeah do you want to describe uh both the movie and who peewee is and i don't think you can really appreciate or the movie they're inextricable sense. yeah yeah it's um god that might be the funniest comedy of the 80s i'm i'm like try i was trying to think of like is there something else that uh -huh. i laughed at more from the 80s and i'm like blanking huh that's interesting i'd have to go through a list of of 80s comedies and yeah because like the only other one i can think i mean i definitely laughed harder at that than like animal house or any of those okay Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's just, so Pee Wee Herman, for those uh, who were not alive during the, the peak of Pee Wee Mania. Um, <laughs> oh, Pee Wee Mania, yeah, it's actually not a bad. Uh, I mean, he was a big cultural figure for a while. Yeah. He was like parodies of Pee Wee Herman. I mean, to the point where like when Eminem recorded his first single in the music video, that's one of the pop culture, probably the least current pop culture culture figure that he references in the music video he dresses up as Pee Wee Herman and oh, wow. he does the <laughs> kind of boy like that I, that sound more crusty the clown than Pee Wee but anyway mm -hmm. so Pee Wee Herman uh is actually a guy named Paul Rubens who was an improvisational comedian who uh was part of the uh, legendary improv group in Los Angeles the Groundlings which is kind of like the farm team for Saturday Night Live um and they probably had their I mean one of the best ensembles in comedy history for like 10 years um and a lot of those people did end up on S SNL when SNL like revamped itself when it was about to get canceled in 1986. Oh, I don't, I didn't know it was about to get canceled then. Yeah, yeah, the ratings were down. Like the 1984 season of SNL, I think it's the 19, it's either 83 or the 84 seasons generally considered to be the absolute worst season of SNL that ever aired. That's probably around when I started watching. <laughs> I re I remember the when they switched the entire cast except I think it was the entire cast except for John Lovitz yeah and Lovitz was one of the guys who was from so let me just go through who was in the groundling groundlings at the same time so if you went to an improv show in Los Angeles randomly sometime between like 1978 and 1985 or so uh maybe not 80 I mean maybe like more 76 to I'd have to check the exact dates but like 76 to like around when people Wee's Big Adventure was made. Mm -hmm. The the cast at a Groundling show would have been Phil Hartman, Paul Rubens, Jan Hooks, John Lovitz, uh, the lady who played Elvira. Um, that that's the one that blows me away. But but go on. Yeah, she started in the ground. I mean, if you ever watch any of she those like uh, those specials she would do for MTV, she's hilarious. Like yeah, and she's doing it all on her feet. It, it's kind of it's it's mind boggling. Huh. It, it's like it, it's kind of not fair that like somebody gets that much talent and looks like that but <laughs> I, yeah, I'll, we can live with it but uh, anyway so Pee Wee Herman is a character that was created by Paul Rubens that is essentially like a large child but not in like not in like a cynical or yeah cynical way he just sort of is channeling his inner child i i guess because usually like when when somebody's like acting kind of in a, in a childlike manner except for maybe jerry lewis it's usually supposed to be like a direct criticism of the character or whoever the character is supposed to be mm -hmm. and peewee is just sort of Ruben has had had this sort of incredible ability to tap into the mindset of a child and, and just sort of follow that um he uh he always wore the same outfit i think in every yeah yeah I everything don't right he's wearing this like suit that's like slightly too small for him and a bow tie that had a um i don't know if he's wearing this bow tie in the movie but it was a bow tie that would spin around there was a button it's a mechanical bow tie it's like a trick bow tie oh no we didn't see that in the in the movie yeah 
and the uh, the bow tie and the suit was actually he borrowed it from the guy who owned the theater where the groundlings performed and then just never returned it <laughs> um same thing with the bow tie the only part of it that he actually owned was were initially wore the shoes which he has these very distinctive sneakers that look kind of like uh kind of like old converse style sneakers i guess yeah i'm trying to uh um, I'm trying to picture the sneakers on on Pee Wee. Right, and the the pants are too short, slightly too <laughs> short, so you always see his socks and and who speaks of this? I I can't do the voice, but <laughs> it's uh he has this incredibly bizarre like like the the closest thing I can think of to compare him to is is Jerry Lewis, except for Lewis would kind of go in and out of a couple characters. Rubens is sort of interesting in that he he just he has this one character and he just he um i mean he commits to the character probably more than anybody committed to a character publicly besides maybe andy kaufman and even andy kaufman would like switch up his characters every couple of years that he was bringing out in public rubens when he created the Pee Wee herman character um wanted the public to think Pee Wee herman was a real person mm -hmm. so when okay. you look at the credits of this movie right it's Pee Wee herman as himself when when he hosted saturday night live it wasn't paul rubens who hosted saturday night live it was Pee Wee herman who mm. hosted saturday night live right and even on let, let me let me grab i have the dvds i'm like 99 percent sure that the word paul rubens does not show up anywhere on the packaging for any of these yeah Pee Wee's playhouse yeah there's no I'm, I'm holding up the box sets for for ron i'm, I'm gonna lend them to ron but this is all of Pee Wee's playhouse oh oh you know what you might not need to lend them to me i think they're on netflix oh they are on netflix i think awesome so maybe, is on netflix. netflix might even have the uh the christmas special then it does but the uh the dvd sets i was watching part of them this morning the transfers are pretty great the Apparently, there's actually a Blu-ray set of all of them that came out pretty recently that were actually reconstructed from the film elements, which I'm guessing probably look, it probably looks amazing, right? Because like most TV releases, um, the best you're going to get is because uh, like most old TV, they were edited, they shoot some of it to film. Most of the time, the best you're going to get is the, like, high-quality, like, broadcast beta videotape because they wouldn't, they would shoot a lot of them to film, but they would edit all of it on video mm -hmm. for broadcast. So, like, uh, in order to release something directly from the 16 millimeter elements, you basically need to reconstruct the entire show from scratch, except the audio track from just, like, film that's sitting around in a, in a warehouse house somewhere oh okay gotcha um like <laughs> it's kind of funny because it puts peewee's Pee playhouse the, the only other films i can think of where that was done like fritz lang's metropolis um leonard malton i think it was leonard malton did it with uh orson wells touch of evil he mm -hmm. like recut it from the original master to be closer to what wells wanted it to be yeah. That, that's a pretty good company, you know. It's Fritz Lang, Orson Welles, Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's it's also just like, and, and so the movie. I, I guess we should get into the movie. So the movie, right, right. Um, the movie is the first real, I guess, Groundlings movie. You could call it like Coneheads is kind of a Groundlings movie. Mo a lot of the like early. Yeah. 90s SNL movies you got like a lot of these people turning up again and again um but yeah the the movie it's it's a love story about Kiwi and what is admittedly the coolest bicycle I've probably <laughs> I mean they they did a great because the thing is if the bicycle wasn't convincing the movie doesn't work you, you gotta under because the the heart of the movie is this love affair between peewee and his bicycle yeah peewee loves his bike oh well, does his bike love him back and, and some, you know it, it ejects francis at the end of the movie okay okay <laughs> 
Francis. There's a little bit of Felix the Cat in there too, right? He's got like this magic bag of tricks that just seems to have exactly the right thing from the prank store at any given moment. Yep. Yeah. His his bike gets stolen, and we follow him across country as he uh, learns valuable lessons about himself and sees America and tries to find his stolen bicycle and dances for a biker gang in a scene that, like, looking at it now and then looking at that next to the scene in Blue Velvet where everybody just starts singing that Roy Orbison song. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I find it really... David Lynch, there's no way in hell David Lynch didn't see this movie at least three times. Why do you say that? The use of red everywhere throughout the film in in conjunction with or I guess as a way to evoke this kind of nostalgic remembrance or or I guess nostalgic feeling so that they can be engaged with about growing up during the 1950s which is like one of the defining maybe the defining element of Lynch's style right like everything from Blue Velvet onward Twin Peaks you got the Red Room you got you know all these kind of anachronistic 50 these details mm-hmm. floating around, uh, you know, the fake soap opera that's always on any TV that's playing during Twin Peaks, uh, the way that the, the the soundtrack, you know, the soundtrack is supposed to kind of evoke that, like, you know, 50s teen rebel thing. You got uh, the, uh, what's his face, the kid with the motorcycles, kind of a parody yeah. of James Dean. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just sort of the, this, like, processing processing growing up during the 1950s from the perspective of an adult which peewee peewee is not exactly an adult paul rubens in order to understand peewee the way that he does i think like i feel like the actual paul rubens probably comes across as like a pretty normal functional adult yeah yeah that was so that's what i always figured um yeah because you don't get the sense of like you get the sense that he loves playing this character, but you, you don't get the sense that he's, like, in some kind of despair over a lost childhood. Like, mm-hmm. he had his childhood the first time, he's just sort of sharing parts of it with us later on. Um, it's not like, like and, and Ron and I were talking about this a lot earlier, like, like uh, you know, where do you draw the line of, like, a childlike adult public figure between you know like a Pee Wee Herman and a Michael Jackson right 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 and, and is, oh I was gonna say one is a uh, one is a man child um um who molests kids hmm. um well Pee- one of them is like a person who wants to be a child and one of them is like a person channeling a child I guess yeah and, and Pee Wee's channeling a child yeah he isn't a child um but but he's channeling one okay oh, now I'm, now I'm imagining a um oh, what movie is it being John Malkovich <laughs> and the ending of it uh, but yeah so so yeah channeling a child okay I like that yeah because like I, I mean I don't get the sense that I mean I don't know anything about Paul Rubin's early life I don't feel like I mean I you know I'm sure somebody knows something about it but you don't get the sense that it, it's like some kind of response to make up for an emotional or, or social lack he just sort of the character sticks Mm -hmm. um and and i think the voices too because he was um i remember i read an interview with him once and he has an incredibly hard time remembering dialogue really yeah so most of the times that he's talking during peewee's playhouse Uh not during the movie the movie supposedly they wrote like because uh he it was it was co-written by rubens and uh phil hartman right of you know snl the simpsons news radio etc and they'd never written a screenplay before, so they got one of those screenwriting books and literally followed it to the letter. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, and it has, and you think about it, it's like, it's a, it, it's an exact three-act structure, um, at least according to Phil Hartman in an in, in, in interview. <laughs> like, <laughs> Phil uh, Hartman, the writer, says it is, so it must be. Yeah, yeah, he said that they had, like, a bulletin board where they're, like, writing out these emotional beats. They had to make sure that he was reunited with the bike 
on exactly page 60 so that they could uh -huh. go into act three wow. so on and so on and so on um and granted there's not like peewee doesn't do a, a ton of like he does a decent amount of talking but i don't feel like the, you know he doesn't have any monologues there's no like long dramatic exchanges there there's not a very long period in this movie of dialogue that right. there, there is there is a uh a dialogue with the not not quite a monologue but a long there's mm -hmm. a long speech as part of the dialogue mm. which is all of what five lines right right the, no, the notable uh the, the his big notable uh speech <laughs> and yeah we have there, there's so much fascinating stuff going on in this movie mm -hmm. um from, from my perspective anyway yeah you see uh let's see oh the first thing he sees is rube goldberg house well, right. the first thing he sees him in uh is is dreaming that he won the tour de france <laughs> um but then afterwards we see his uh like a five minute scene of his rube goldberg house mm. and and you can kind of see that he had the peewee's playhouse set in his in his mind yeah. in his mind yeah because like the the actual Peewee's Playhouse set was designed by the uh, the cartoonist Gary Panter, okay. uh, who was known for the cartoon strip Jimbo and like drawing. He has this like very bizarre neo primitivist drawing style, um, and he was mostly known for being an underground cartoonist around New York um, around the same time as like Kim Deitch. Um, he's like the, the generation of underground cartoonists that came right after the, the Robert Crumb generation. So like oh, oh, oh. 70s right. kind of, um, not quite as concerned with transgression as with like dealing with the, um, I guess ephemeral culture generally like the 80s is the is one of the earliest the 80s is when you, you start having a second generation of people who or when when the the people who grew up taking the idea of a mass pop culture for granted are coming of the uh, becoming adults and creating the things um and you you end up as, as a result with the, this kind of odd mixed visual language of like a lot of pastiche, a lot of like historical anachronisms. Um, and oh, I was going to say, but that's not new to the 80s. Or are you just saying this is, it's this confluence of things, or a, not confluence. It's, this... it's not new to the 80s, but it's not the dominant tone of film. I mean, I guess the 80s is sort of where film starts giving up on realism as sort of the the thing that's going to bring it to where it wants to go mm -hmm. you know the the kind of like oh if we if we can somehow capture reality and put it on film we're gonna end up with a, a great film um that whole notion starts to unravel and the only way to really discuss like personal feelings emotions and or i, I guess like the, the symbol systems of individuals start to become populated with things from the popular culture as opposed to say genetic Eric life experiences or um this is just a tiny bit going back this so this is now 77 so slightly mm -hmm. earlier but i but it, this is reminding me of um earlier on um i think it was um you and alex or or maybe it was alex who pointed out that there was a mcdonald's there oh and the third uh close sorry, encounters the third kind yeah yeah oh yeah we had that whole cover yeah because there's so many like product placements of mcdonald's in that movie it's so bizarre right it could have been any generic diner um, Right and and they placed the McDonald's in the middle of nowhere. Um, I don't know that that's that's suddenly the the image that I had. From what you yeah, were and and at a certain point, something like a McDonald's, uh, McDonald's is like being going to a McDonald's. If you grew up in the United States at a certain time and your parents weren't vegans, so you know ninety nine percent of the population, um, there there are these like kind of early childhood emotional connections that one makes with say the interior of a mcdonald's or something yeah, yeah. and you're tempted later to use it as a shorthand it's it's the uh well the going to mcdonald's is a big deal in um in mac and me yeah you even get a six minute dance sequence yeah like the the kind of bike i mean granted the kind of bike the peewee's using in this movie i don't think they ever made outside of for this movie but the the general style of bike most people were not riding bicycles that looked like that in the 1980s you know that's a 1950s like banana bike yeah no they're well there were six early 60s maybe yeah 
yeah, yeah. Like the uh-huh. the newest one that I've ever seen in the wild, dated from like mid '60s, I think. Uh, not that I'm like spending a lot of time looking for old bicycles, but <laughs> uh, yeah, that was all. Everybody else was uh, um, riding a BMX bike, mm. it was all BMX. Um, and I think like the first shot where we're in like reality after he realizes that he hasn't won the Tour de France, um, we see Pee Wee in bed, but in the same shot and actually foregrounded far more than Pee Wee is this Howdy Doody doll. Uh-huh. Ah. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, the. Uh, Figuring the influence of something like Howdy Doody on on, on something like the Pee Wee Herman character, like it, it's it's almost incalculable, right? It's it's this um it's this like evocation of of being a kid and spending time with the uh, kind of kind of feeling this this strange relationship with the television developing. I want to know how many academic essays have been written about the influence of Howdy Doody on Pee Wee Herman. I'm kind of curious how many academic essays have ever been written about Pee Wee. Herman. Herman. Herman, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's a deeper movie than it wants to let on, or than most people take it to be. What do you mean? So the, the the surface content is very silly, um, but it, that aesthetic of like working through '50s stuff through just sort of jumbling everything, kind of in a blender almost, and then you know to, tossing it in. Um, God, yeah, I I'm having a hard time, having a hard time quite articulating this, but. No, that's okay. Yeah. The movie is so visual. Um, it's Tim Burton. Um, yeah, this is Tim Burton's first film. This is Danny Elfman's first film. Obviously, it's Pee Wee Herman's first film. Yeah. Um, although Pee Wee Herman had appeared on The Gong Show before then. Are you serious? And The Dating Game, yeah. Uh, Pee Wee Herman was on The Dating Game? Three times, and he won. You're won kidding. Them. Yeah. Wow. So Bill Hartman was on The Dating Game. Steve Martin was on The Dating Game. It seemed like anybody who became an actor in Los Angeles in the late 1970s ended up on the dating game at some point. Uh, or, or was on the dating game before they became famous. Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, they were always on the dating game, like, before yeah, yeah. they were famous, for sure. Like, and, um, but, but when, so when you said Pee Wee Herman was on the dating game, do you, you mean it was Paul Rubens or it was Paul Rubens as Pee Wee Herman? Oh, oh, it was Paul Rubens. Oh, 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 oh. No, no. He didn't go on in character. He did go on the gong show in character. Okay. I thought you meant that he was in the dating game in character. No. <laughs> so that's why I was so amazed that he won. Oh, okay. And another great 80s comedy that I don't think I laughed at nearly as hard as I laughed at this is The Jerk. All right. And that's, yeah. wait, so so you don't think The Jerk is that funny or you laugh at The Jerk, but... At, at I mean, The Jerk's funny. really funny, but this, um, I don't know, something about it just, I, I laughed away. I mean, there's like, there's great, great moments in The, the Jerk that I... I think about on a fairly regular basis, particularly when he, when Martin first gets the, uh, he first becomes rich. He's walking around in the bathrobe with like his socks on. He's got those ridiculous glasses on and he walks over to this like office water cooler with wine goblets on the side of it. Uh And, and I think like visually that's the, the two best visual representations of like McMansion living I've ever seen. On film or video, it's yeah, it's Steve Martin doing that, and then the the like kind of low grade consumer CRT television in the Sopranos bedroom that's on this fake Roman pillar, right? Like when whenever uh, Tony Tony and Carmel are watching TV in bed, the TV is just on this like fake Greco Roman <laughs> pillar, and that always would crack me up when I was going through the Sopranos, but <laughs> we had wow. Okay, we went Sopranos, The Jerk. You haven't laughed as hard, uh, you know. Yeah, I was like falling over. Yeah. It was oh my god. You did. You almost. Uh, I don't know if you you just turned or if you almost knocked over the uh, the computer. Oh well, so Liz and I were sitting um uh, sitting a little bit apart on the couch, so I tried to put it between us, so we each had Ron access, and I, I think neither of us said. <laughs> <laughs> on the camera. Yeah. Um, 
yeah and so I, I guess the reason i wanted to watch this movie tonight because i i i was kind of like I, I think you said this morning like let's do the pod or yesterday we're like let's do the podcast tomorrow yeah yeah i was like okay and i didn't i didn't know what what movie we were gonna watch and then i um but for the the last week i've been going through an enormous amount of phil hartman crap that's how did you uh how did you go down that uh that rabbit hole or that uh, uh so i I've been oh, writing yeah. a book on the history of television for a while, um, or at least I've been assembling a pile of random manuscript <laughs> fragments about various um, things having to do with television. And mm -hmm. on, uh, a couple days ago, I just suddenly, like, I woke up, started writing, and I didn't stop writing until I went to bed. I, I finished about 7,000 words in one day. Wow. But different articles, not just, not one uh, one part of the book. Uh, yeah, like four, four and a half articles. I published a couple of them on uh, the website Writers Without Money. Okay. Um, I wrote, yeah, 2,500 words on BoJack Horseman, 1,200 words on The Sopranos, 1,200 words on Oz. And I think, I think I, I wrote a thing about Gary Shandling. Yeah. And so the next yeah. thing I wanted to write about was Phil Hartman. And I realized that Phil Hartman is an exceptionally difficult figure to write about in insofar as there's no there's no piece of work that is entirely his in his filmography. Uh -huh. There's no like auteur moment that you can use as a skeleton key for like, oh, this is what this guy wanted to do or express or something. Mm -hmm. You just have like these ensemble parts in uh, you have this very wide variety of fairly ephemeral artifacts, you know, like I, I watched probably about three or three and a half hours worth of old late night talk show appearances. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the first 10 years of The Simpsons. I, I actually, I found out the first episode of The Simpsons that I ever saw was the last episode that Phil Hartman was ever on. Oh, okay. Was it also, um, the, did he leave the show or when he died? When he died. It's okay. uh, season 10's Bart the Mo Bart the Mother, uh, where Bart accidentally kills a bird with a BB gun, I think, and then it causes lizards to take over Springfield. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and that's the last episode that Phil Hartman ever appeared on. Um, oh, because no kidding. Of his, because of his being murdered by his uh, wife. Yeah. Is that how it was? Wow. I remember him dying like that it was a surprise when he died. Mm. Oh yeah, no, that's Hollywood. like Holly, that's some Hollywood Babylon shit. Like he uh yeah, it was a murder suicide. His wife like relapsed on cocaine and then just came home at three in the morning one night, agitated, and uh took a gun that they bought for uh home defense, mm -hmm. uh shot him in the head three times, and then drove over to her ex boyfriend's house, hysterical saying, I killed phil i killed phil mm -hmm. he didn't believe it so they both went back to the hartman residence and then the police had a standoff or well she locked herself in the room with with hartman's corpse uh while ron douglas her ex-boyfriend was calling the police to report that you know there'd been a murder right the police had this big armed standoff and as it turns out, they, uh, you know, like maybe half hour into the standoff, they figure out that they're having a standoff with nobody because uh, she killed herself. Uh, okay. And there was actually there was a special on ABC that aired in September with like a lot of stuff that came out about that that, w that wasn't publicly available until then. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called The Last Days of Phil Hartman. It, it's definitely worth a look um sounds kind of creepy it's yeah it's i mean it's not like a great documentary by any means it's not like a great film but you get to see a lot of home videos mm -hmm. um him on vacation just sort of sailing around on a boat but um, so why did you decide to to write about phil, phil hartman specifically well be, because I, I think he's one of the major he's a major player in the history of tv comedy in the united states he had probably the single best voice certainly for tv comedy i i possibly of anybody ever um and he uh yeah just some, some kind of fascinated me about it like i i can you know i can watch like clips of him in various things pretty much endlessly then i realize like i have no 
there's this kind of opacity to Hartman, right? Like he can fall so deeply into a character that, um, I don't know, I just never, I, I realized at some point, like, oh my God, that this guy like consistently makes me laugh, but I have no, literally no sense of what is this person like as a human being? Mm -hmm. Where is this coming from? What, you know, what is, what is this guy trying to express or communicate to me? The uh, Phil Phil Hartman, the actor, not what is the not what is he trying to express through the character? Yeah, yeah. Like I, I guess I don't know. When you look at a large body of work by a single person, you can usually find a couple of obsessive themes or motifs or something. And I mean, there's certainly like so superficially, there's the you know Hartman would always play these kind of pompous ass characters, right? Like he's, he's, news radio on news radio. Yeah, yeah, news radio. He's the uh, you know. He, he's basically like non-political Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> um, on The Simpsons, he's a lot of people, but he's like Lionel Hutz, the attorney, Troy McClure, the guy who sells Springfield the monorail and Marge versus the monorail, so on, so on, so on. On, on SNL, most of it, you know, he's the guy that they would have played Donald Trump in the 1980s. Oh, and wow. And Hooks was actually the person they would have play Ivana Trump. Uh, you know, obviously Bill Clinton, that was the, the famous, the most famous impression. I think he did on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, yeah. You know, unfrozen caveman lawyer. There's that thread. Um, he did a really yeah, good Bill Clinton. Yeah, yeah. He did a really good Bill Clinton. Oh, yeah, yeah. The the thing where he walks into the McDonald's and just starts eating the food off everybody's tray is, is like, <laughs> for me, that's probably the best SNL sketch that ever aired. Like, not that I've watched all 40 years of SNL, but, like, I can't think of a better SNL sketch I've ever watched. Wow. Now that's high praise. Yeah. I mean, it's... Like, I mean, he was probably the most talented sketch actor that ever appeared on SNL. Okay, okay. I'm I'm glad I'm glad that you're um uh what am I trying to say? Well, that you specified sketch character. Um, yeah. It, well, he had like a a very specific set of skills, right? Like when when I say that he fell into a character, his his falling into his characters, they aren't. He has no concern for realism. He has like. He, he's more comfortable with using artifice as an effect in his performances than probably any other actor besides maybe Nicolas Cage. Um, right, because like when, when he's doing these characters, a lot of it, I, I, in kind of the peewee way, it's like a pastiche of, of like old movie speech patterns, right? Like it, he, he would fall very easily into like these, you know, mid, a radio show, like like 40s, 50s radio show, private eye detective characters. Mm -hmm. Or, um, and I, I think to some extent, that's why they could never figure out what to do with the guy in a feature length film. Yeah. Are you describing what are the, what are the, some of the, the a great Phil Hartman film? Uh. Well, Pee Wee's Big Adventure is the only one that's actually like... Any good? Uh, I mean, I'm trying to think like what there's um i mean the worst of the worst so there's jingle all the way the one where arnold schwarzenegger and sinbad fight over a children's toy for an hour and a half mm -hmm. um which i did see when i was very young but i have not seen that since probably before i saw peewee's playhouse somebody someone's setting off fireworks in the background oh is that what that sound is yes oh okay i was hearing these little these little booms i don't know who who's setting off fireworks in the background but somebody setting off fireworks in background um yeah so the the steve martin reboot re reboot reimagining re i mean the jay and silent bob rules what would you call the steve martin bilko it's like <laughs> Terrible, terrible movie, but he was in that. Um, so Sergeant Bilko, So I Married an Axe Murderer, Coneheads. Oh, God, that's right, the Coneheads movie. Um, I mean, oh, what a Small nice Soldiers movie. is actually a decent movie. Which movie? Uh, Small Soldiers, the one where all the, the like action figure toys decide that they're going to invade the house and they start like bombing the oh. store house that's a joe dante movie right yeah yeah and he did two movies with joe dante he played um he played the president of the united states in the second civil war which is also a pretty good movie okay oh yeah uh, wait john joe dante directed that yep oh cool mm -hmm. all right uh, joe dante is the director of uh, gremlins and gremlins 2 for those yeah. of you counting at home gremlins 2 was probably my favorite movie 
of that year. I, oh, I worked with a, she was amazing. Yeah, I worked at a movie theater at the time. This was in, so I would have been in college um, when it came out, I think. Yeah, 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 because it came out a few years after Gremlins. It wasn't, it, it, it didn't follow it up immediately. Mm. Yeah, different, well, I want to say it was a different movie, a different kind of movie, um, but I didn't realize, and I may mention this before, just how funny uh, and how silly Gremlins is supposed to be. Oh yeah, Gremlins, like, when I first watched it, I was like, this is terrible. I keep laughing at everyone. Like the yeah. when she gives the monologue about Santa falling down the chimney and his neck breaks. Yeah, and that's her dad. Yeah. Right, right. And I'm like, this is you know, the subject matter would make you think that they're trying to play it for pathos. Its place in the overall narrative would make you think they're playing it for pathos. But no, it's it's actually comedy. And and Dante, Joe Dante is He's like one of those like hidden treasures. Like I can't, he's done a lot of very good movies and almost none of them besides Gremlins got any attention and Gremlins I don't think was understood properly. No, no, I can tell you it wasn't. Was not had, like Small Soldiers, the only person who understood what, what the hell was going on in that movie was Jonathan Rosenbaum. Who's that? Uh, he was the uh, film critic for the Chicago Reader, whatever, like the alt paper in Chicago. He, he's he's a, I mean, he's probably seen more movies than any man alive. Oh, 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 okay. You've mentioned him before. You've yeah, mentioned him. And, and I had a very awkward lunch with him in Chicago. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's right, you talked about that. All right. Yeah. And Sorry, you know how great I am with names. So like we talk he, about the same person. He's not exactly he was a very close friend of Roger Ebert's, but he does not have anywhere near the name recognition of a Roger Ebert. But no, 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 no. Um, well it's funny, I was gonna say about Joe Dante, you know, so Joe Dante's um well you're saying about Joe Dante not getting the recognition he deserves, and I was like, Yeah, Joe Dante isn't the household name he should be. Yeah, yeah, because those he's been consistently making great films. They have like small soul. Soldiers is one of the few films I can think of in the mid 90s, like mid 90s of all things, um, criticizing like U.S. imperialism abroad and mm -hmm. trying to do it in a giant right. Like the the whole thing is just a riff on the Gulf War. Um, I feel like that. I may feel like that just because Jonathan Rosenbaum mentioned it in his review of it. However, you know when it came out, I'm imagining. I, I didn't re I, I didn't realize it was that old. I, I thought it was more recent. Okay. No, no. I think I think. So. Small Soldiers was the last live action role that Hartman had before he died. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, pretty, yeah. Oh, maybe it was 98. No, yeah, it was 98. It was definitely 98. Um, I just watched that uh, a few months ago. I'd never seen it before. Oh, yeah, I, I bought the VHS. I saw it at the thrift store like a while back and, and watched it. And I was like, this is pretty great. Yeah, 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 it is. I never... And it got like shit on at the time because I, I think it came out... Probably the only reason why they, they gave him... They gave Dante money to make small soldiers is because of the success of toy story a couple of years beforehand oh right yeah, yeah. right like the whole toys coming alive thing was was hot and kind of the same way that like a bug's life and ants came out within months of each other around then yeah yeah and uh but it's it's the anti toy story right <laughs> oh totally it's not a it's it's not this heartfelt emotional thing it's a um, like you said it's a it's a critique of uh u.s military policy mm. right and, and consumerism and and sort of the the, the kind of the, the um the way that we can wall ourselves off in our houses away from the chaos that the actions of of our government uh create abroad um it's like a weird kind of chickens coming home to roost scenario i guess the the movie i don't well, know no, just like the these toys that are used to promote like rah 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 oh oh yeah 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 you know we're the military giant of the world we can sit on you if you fuck with us and then they're like destroying this comfortable <laughs> suburban house yeah just like annexing it like that you know they're like liberating the house like it was afghanistan i'm, I'm making air quotes when i say liberating just yeah. for the record but <laughs> 
Oh, right. I can see them. You know, anyone listening to this can't see the air quotes. Right. Without without the clarification. But yeah, Pee Wee. I, I guess what was the what was the first what what's your first memory of encountering Pee Wee Herman as a public figure? He's said in that live appearance. So like eighty six. Uh, something. Let's see. Where was that? That sounds about right. Okay. So like his first Saturday Night Live hosting appearance. That's actually when. Uh, that's when they they figured out who held Phil Hartman was. Okay. That was actually the reason why he ended up on on SNL. Um, that's kind of interesting. Like, what was the? Because I was not. I obviously was not alive in the late 1980s. Outside of a um, a four month stretch um, towards towards the very end. Mm. I caught the credits. <laughs> um, what was the general public perception of him? Because by the time I knew who Pee Wee Herman was, I sort of, I knew my dad really loved Pee Wee's Big Adventure, mm. but also that there was some kind of thing having to do with his 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 penis hanging out in public that couldn't be explained to me. So was, I never knew him as like a present concern. Pee Wee's penis? Are you talking about Paul Rubens being caught masturbating in the theater? Yes, in, yeah. in a porno theater. Which when when I when I found that out later, I was kind of like, "It's a porno theater." It's like creepier if you're not masturbating in the porno <laughs> theater, right? I mean, I know the law is the here law. For the plot. But... <laughs> I'm... I'm here for the love angle. <laughs> Um, you know, she yeah. brought the he brought that pizza over. <laughs> Somebody's you know, she, <laughs> I have to the pay theory back. of Chekhov's gun tells me that eventually someone's going to eat that pizza. <laughs> so why put it in the beginning of the movie? <laughs> Uh, and no good porn. No good porn is complete without the money shot being eating the pizza after the sex. <laughs> Well, the thing with those those pizza porn, uh, as soon as I like knew how to, or like when, once I got to a certain point, being able to analyze images, right? Like if, if you're gonna cut a hole in the bottom of a pizza box and then flop somebody's dick in it, a that's got to be some cold three day old pizza, or else you're getting grease burn grease burns on your junk. <laughs> D you would have to glue the pizza to the box, or else the pizza is just gonna fall to the bottom of the box. Mm -hmm. without or actually no even with like a, a pretty impressive erection number three <laughs> it, it yeah it's just like the the layer like when you think about it from a like how would we do this as a special effects person it becomes kind of wait are you thinking of a particular porno in which there was a penis sticking out of the pizza in the box oh yeah yeah there was there were like multiple websites that specialize in that when i was a teenager they the, the like kidding that around in the middle school and the high school are you serious yeah yeah it was called the big sausage pizza and it was just like the guy walks up to the door every single time he's like hi pizza delivery and she like opens the pizza in front of the delivery driver while he's still holding it because i've literally never done that any time i've picked up a pizza like maybe she just doesn't trust the quality uh -huh. of the pizza from this place but granted if they're gluing the pizza to the actual box and leaving it out for three days for the sake of the delivery person's penis <laughs> um you know not hating on delivery people here you know you guys are doing some some you know great non-pornographic stuff right now but yeah yeah they're essential services right off, off in porno land 20 years ago <laughs> or not 20 years ago uh, no that that's too far 15 years ago maybe um yeah i mean a quality check although a quality check like if if uh, you know if, if you get a really cold pizza with a hole in the middle of it and part of it kind of smells it tastes like penis sweaty penis <laughs> Are you really gonna order another pizza from that place? <laughs> wait, wait, wait! So I still want to know what would happen. You go up to the door. Oh, oh, oh! oh so, so he goes. He goes up to the door, mm -hmm. and I mean, I guess it's like the popcorn, the the quote unquote the popcorn trick, right? You put the hole in the bottom of the the popcorn thing yeah. in the movies, and then person reaches in for the popcorn. It's like, oh, penis all over my popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> That's an endearing move. Um, but anyway, so so she gets up and she opens the, the the pizza box to check the quality of the pizza, presumably, and it's like, whoa, there's a 
there's a hole in the bottom of the box and the guy's dick's just in the middle of the pizza where that little like uh that little table thingy would normally be holding it together uh -huh. um you know you know that little like white plastic uh three-legged thing they use in the middle of the pizza sometimes when you wear it yeah yeah and uh yeah just imagine that was somebody's penis and then um you know they uh they never show you the shot where they were wiggling it off the guy's dick because you know that's like that's probably more nerve-wracking than arousing i mean like paper cuts or uh that's one of the very few times in life when paper cuts would be serious business and so, they, so so there wasn't like a blowjob of while the, the pizza was still was still hanging i mean this site was up for a long time so but the site specialized in this specific scenario specifically yes a woman orders a pizza opens it while the delivery guy's holding it and finds that his penis is in fact in the middle of this takeout pizza do you know if this still exists somewhere um you know what Fuck my search history. I'm going for it. <laughs> what's it, and what's the URL again? I mean, I I'm imagining the URL big or no? I search big sausage. Oh God. Okay, never image search big sausage. <laughs> um, like not not even there's not even like sex stuff. It's just like a lot of pictures of like very fat men eating sausages, <laughs> like actual sausages. Big sausage pizza. Here we go. Domino's. Big, big uh let's see imdb calls it quote a tv series okay um, it also wow. has an imdb page because i guess it was submitted to a film festival or something um i mean i'm guessing it was probably just like big sausage pizza.com okay. I, I don't know let, let me let me turn on a private window let's see if this still exists but yeah, and then they, you know, they put the pizza, the pizza would end up on the table, though, so it's like the pizza would never fall out of the box, it's not like they, you know, tossed it in wild passion somewhere, uh -huh. you just have this, like, cold dick pizza sitting in the foreground of the shot for the, the whole film usually i mean not that you know i i probably did not watch any of these front to back as is the nature of the medium mm -hmm. i mean i feel like I, I didn't actually watch very many of them period because i am uh personally i'm i'm more aroused by fresh pizza yeah so do they eat the pizza in the end <laughs> Uh, no, nobody ever eats the pizza, thank God. Uh, that's a, yeah, why, why, why people had to keep coming back to the site. <laughs> hoping, hoping that finally, finally someone would eat the pizza. Let's see, the bigsausagepizza.com says Reality Gang is no longer accepting new members. So basically, they're just like stuck with memberships, but they're out of business. So they're keeping the website up until everybody's membership expires. Oh, okay. So Big Sausage Pizza is no more? No. And I mean, I don't think any other, I mean, I can't think of anything where it was like that blatantly. Because the first couple times I saw it, you know, I'm like, I'm a young teenager. I would live on pizza if I wouldn't die from it. Um, and I'm looking at it, it's like they're wasting all this perfectly good pizza. And that was what bothered me. Mm -hmm. And then the thought of anybody actually eating the pizza bothered me. Yeah. Uh, and there's just, it's a no win scenario. And I'm kind of amazed it took them this long to go out of business. Eating three day old penis pizza. Yeah, right. Like dick pizza. Hi, my name's Dick Pizza, Private Eye. <laughs> Only one eye in the middle. But uh, um, to your question about. Uh, uh, Pee Wee and then Paul Rubens in the in the um masturbating in the in the porn porn theater. Um um yeah presumably not with pizza was. on his lap. What was that? Presumably not with pizza on his lap. If he had pizza on his lap, then he'd be raking it in. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, he would have been yeah. you know, he he invented the internet before Al Gore did. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not like he did it in character or anything like that. You mean jerk off in the theater? Yeah, yeah. 
You would hope. Yeah, no, that that would be the the thought of Pee Wee Herman, the Pee Wee Herman character. Yeah. Well, it just it was it it was a victimless crime, mm. um, and there, there was a victim, and it was Paul Rubens's uh, career, and um, the end of Pee Wee Herman is a cultural phenomenon. Mm. Um, I can't remember was Pee Wee's Playhouse still on when that happened? No, it had just gone off the air. Okay. Uh, I only know that because I was reading a bunch of interviews with Paul Rubens uh, over the last couple of days. I wonder what would have happened because right now we're seeing, you know, somebody, some, some, something happens, somebody does something, and then they're not coming back, signed on for the next season of the show, or the show is, is put on hiatus. And think, or you know, look, look with um, Kevin Spacey and um, uh, what's the TV show and House of Cards. Right. Didn't and they, they just had the last season and they just wrote them off. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think there was probably a little bit of that like animosity that people have towards Jerry Lewis there um because like I, I was so when, when we, we were watching the movie for the the podcast um the podcast was watching it with me earlier today I was watching a bunch of Pee Wee's Playhouse episodes yeah and Liz loved the movie could not stand the Pee Wee's Playhouse episodes what was the difference between them I'm not really sure. I mean, Pee Wee's Playhouse, I feel like, was more aggressively weird and anti-plot than this movie. Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah, yeah, because Pee Wee's Playhouse, it's sort of just like a lot of, like, there is a structure to every episode. It's pretty similar. And, and, you know, like, broad, broad structure to a lot of other children's variety television programs. You got, you open up with the intro, um, he always introduces the secret word, uh, either Captain Carl Carl or Cowboy Curtis or somebody comes by. That's that's Mr. Rogers style. Right. And then there's a Penny cartoon, which is that claymation cartoon that, that's always in the middle of it. Right. And then you go back to the Playhouse action. There's usually some kind of sequence of like a very poorly green screen Pee Wee Herman riding a motorbike or going through the the supermarket or this, that, or the other thing. And the, and the every episode ends with another very obviously fake green screen of him on... Uh, uh, what looks like a moped just riding along the coast of somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the, there aren't as many direct gags. I mean, part of that is, is like Pee Wee's Playhouse, it, it, he, he's acknowledging that there's an older audience, but it is very much children's television. Like, we are not the primary audience. Children are the primary audience. Um, it's not like a winky thing where it's it's like uh, like John Kay on Ren and Stimpy saying, or, or just sort of being like, look, look, you know, in the abstract, this is kids' TV, but really this is like incredibly bawdy underground comics mm -hmm. kind of stuff that I'm sneaking sneaking past the kids to get to the adults. Pee-wee's Playhouse was uh was the what I want to say Pee Wee's Playhouse was parodying something that it itself was. Yeah, and it's like it's a kind hearted parody. Yeah. It's not really like you never get the sense in any of pretty much in any of Ruben's work. Like he's just not he doesn't seem like an angry person. No, just one of you into onanism. And he's not really like there's a lot that's subversive and bizarre, but there's not really much in the way of like there's nothing transgressive, I guess, is what I would say. Mm. in his work whereas you know Ren and Stimpy is is all about the aesthetics of the, the transgressive um so how would you describe so what so what is peewee like, like peewee the character if not transgressive I'm, I'm, what is the opposite or or um well so 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 like transgressive would be showing things that go against the accepted rules or mores of society so like mm -hmm. Lou Reed is transgressive um you know uh, you know Goya's disasters of war is transgressive because it's incredibly violent and it's not really something you can bring into polite society okay um because it essentially rejects the the foundations upon or the unspoken foundations upon which society rests um I don't know on Pee Wee's Playhouse I 
got the sense like he was very worried about making sure he was a good role model to children. He seems like very and and, and in the interviews like he comes across this way too. Like he felt like this enormous sense of responsibility because I think having access to this childlike mind state, he kind of realized like just how impressionable children are and just mm-hmm. how much power he had as this this TV personality in that situation which is really funny because it, or not funny but but kind of uh, ironic in a way that he would he would end up in this sort of like one man me too situation when he was that concerned about um basically giving legitimacy to whatever power was handed to him by his success in the entertainment industry mm. um right like like none of the like i i never heard or yeah i i, I guess i guess that was my that was my point but, um you know there you, you're never seeing like you're never seeing boundary pushing for the sake of boundary pushing there's no moment on peewee's playhouse oh where, all right all right okay okay you're like oh sort of god they what showed was... that on kids tv yeah uh, right right it wasn't like that um but you know yeah. in terms of being a responsible uh children's television he was also you know part of the show was getting kids to scream real loud that was the instruction whenever they had the secret word mm. where he made ice cream soup right in the pilot was was that the pilot that was a pilot I watched it this morning. Okay, maybe that's why I remember it so well. I always remember ice cream soup. Um, right, and he's got that like bizarre fudge, high cot fudge dispenser that looks like a. I mean, honestly, it looks like a stuffed Terry the pterodactyl turned into like a, a like ketchup spigot or something. But... Terry, Terry the pterodactyl. Oh, there's so many great characters on that uh, on mm. that show. Yeah. yeah, and it's just such a visual feast. Like that set is probably the most elaborate set that was ever produced for children's. I mean, not that I I'm any expert expert on children's television but that set is like a thing of beauty and and like even when it's clearly the show is clearly being pitched to the kids I can just get lost in background details. Mm. Like if the action that's going on in the foreground is boring, it's just like a place to exist for a half an hour. I think everybody needs to watch the show now just to fully appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you've never seen an episode of Pee Wee's Playhouse, I'm not saying like it's not it's not binge TV. Um, if you're a, a grown ass man like myself or Ron, you may have a hard time digesting more than say two or three episodes in any given sitting uh-huh. but while you're there it's a it, nothing else quite ever looked like it on television mm. um, that i can think of i mean there's stuff that definitely took from it and i think when when adult swim aired reruns of it a couple of years ago that was a really good move on their part because they realized like oh this was an, an enormous visual influence on everything we've been running on our network for- so i'm trying to bin- sorry sorry go ahead Oh no no! Just the 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 influence of Pee Wee's Playhouse on the Adult Swim kind of stuff is like incalculable. Mm-hmm. I was just um um when you're talking about that it's not binge uh, it's not bingeable TV. I was actually I was trying to imagine now realizing that it's on Netflix mm-hmm. that. I was imagining myself binge watching it and it feels like um, what binge watching Mr. Rogers would be. Um, yeah, I got through like three episodes and then I kept putting them on because I wanted to watch through the, because uh, Phil Hartman's only on the first season of Pee Wee's Playhouse. Okay. Because um, then he got cast on SNL uh, right after the, the first season was finished. Uh, um, yeah, and I got through like three episodes. I think I, I kept playing stuff on the disc for like two, three more episodes episodes but then I, I wandered off and I was like all right I'm gonna make tater tots and this is just the thing I'm <laughs> Which I made homemade tater tots today, and it turned out good. Mm. Yeah, we gotta get. We we need to be in a post-pandemic world so that I can have some of those tater tots. Indeed, I didn't realize how easy it was. It's like I don't know. I I just thought there was something. I I guess any time that you see something in like exactly uniform sizes and shapes when you buy it at the grocery store, you're a little intimidated. But huh. I mean, it's kind of just like making matzo balls, but with a potato. No, really. Yeah, you you just um put like an inch of water in a pan, put a cover on the pan, put some potatoes in it, however many potatoes you want, cook, uh, boil the water, let the water boil for like six, seven minutes. 
and then just grate the potato down. Put a little flour, a little bit of salt, pepper, whatever you want, and then just bake it for 30 minutes and you're done. That's it? That's it. That's all it is. Oh. And you know, ha uh, like breakfast hash brown patty, uh -huh. same deal, except <laughs> instead of making them into little balls, you just make it into like a hamburger patty. Oh, but it's all the same ingredients and... Yeah, I mean, depending, you know, you're seasoning it to taste like I put a little bit of like dill seasoning and some oregano in it, but, uh, you know, you're part parsley is a big that's why usually you have those little green flecks when you were uh tater tots at a restaurant is because they'll have um uh, that's parsley fresh parsley usually in it but oh okay what's um, the, uh, what's the ratio of uh, flour to potato um you don't need a lot of flour um okay. the flour is basically just to dry out the potato okay slightly so the the longer you let the potatoes sit and cool down after you boil them the less flour you're gonna need i use I use like a maybe maybe like a quarter cup of flour for three potatoes. Okay. I mean, not much flour at all. Um, it's just the thing that that holds the potato scrapings together. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. When you were saying not a lot, I thought you meant just like a sprinkle. So. All right. So oh no, not not a sprinkle. Like like there's a decent amount of it. You got to mix everything together in a bowl and all that, but. Um, I think I put it on 425, but I, I probably would put it on a higher temperature if I do it again. Now that I'm using my oven, mm -hmm. I've learned that uh, whatever the recipe calls for, I need to do about uh, 25 degrees uh, hotter. Mm. So if I need to preheat the oven to 350 on my oven, preheat it to 375. Yeah, yeah. It can be like yeah, using the oven because I, I feel like I've gotten decent at using the stove, but I, I don't have a lot of oven experience. and. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, dealing with those temperature fluctuations based on like where in the oven did I put this? Yeah, 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 right. Like, did should I put it? Should I put it? Should I have put it higher or should I put it lower? Mm -hmm. Um, should I move the tray uh, to get it right in the middle? Um, How well does the tray conduct heat? Because with pans, when you're um, like frying something, a lot of that has to do with the the underside of the pan. Because if it, you know, if it heats perfect, like a really nice pan, it's going to heat everything evenly. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but most of us are not working with super duper nice pans. So you got to kind of take into account like, okay, there's there's temperature differences across this thing. And mm -hmm. one way to get around that, obviously, is you just cover the, the pan, but you can't always do that. And I've learned recently that uh, Pyrex and metal mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, don't hold heat in the same way. Huh. Or so, so I, I actually, you know what? What? I wonder if part of the problem was that the oven was too was too uh, too low because I was using a Pyrex loaf pan mm -hmm. um, and for something and I just I go back every five minutes for I don't know how many you know I probably had to do spend at least twenty minutes longer than it called for but now that I wonder if it was just the oven had to be uh, had to be set higher. Um, I was oh, yeah, I mean reheating the oven is always a big deal because that's the only way that you know the the temperatures consistent across. It's the same reason you don't put like when you cook pasta like you're supposed to put you're, you're only supposed to put it in once it's boiling a because it can end up really starchy at the end if you do it any earlier but b so that you can time it exactly because you know the exact temperature of the water only when it's boiling okay oh right 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 um so peewee so peewee any last thoughts <laughs> Um, I mean, probably going to be a lot of them. I'm still working on the Phil Hartman article and the, the yeah. larger TV book. So I, I guess as we, um, as we go forward, oh, actually we're, uh, we might have a, a, like guest panel almost next week. If, uh, if all the chips fall together, right. So that, that's something to look forward to perhaps not next week, but at least in the near future, because, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about, um, they had it coming, which was, uh, directed by John Jost, who will will definitely be on the program at mm -hmm. some point, probably probably more than once in, you know, because I, I don't see the show getting canceled anytime soon. <laughs> I know a guy at the network. And, um, <laughs> and uh, Blake Eckert, who was, I believe, the cinematographer on that one, but he's also directed a lot of uh, pretty great in indie movies. Um, he's Adam Missouri, um, and he 
and I acted brief, full disclosure, I acted very briefly in the beginning of one of his films called Only Coyotes Kill for Fun. I do not know if my part was cut, but I'm a, uh, I'm a gay drifter who ends up in the wrong warehouse and I get killed. Wait, so have you seen the movie to see if you're in it? No, no. I mean, this, this movie was like... So, like, Blake Eckert's movies have slightly better distribution than, like, my movies do. Oh, okay, okay. Um, to put that in perspective, uh, my first movie, which is more than 10 years old now, has slightly less than a thousand YouTube hits. Um, Any time to tweet that out again. <laughs> Because I tweeted that, uh, like, very early on. I don't know if, uh, if you recall when you, when you brought it up. Um, might be the first time that uh, you brought up the movie. So I tweeted the link to it. Mm. 500, oh, yeah, yeah. at least, of those uh, views might be attributed to um, to that one tweet alone. Probably, yeah. At least, like, probably half of them. You think so? Uh, I mean, uh, I don't think anywhere else... Would have driven traffic there? No one's ever... There's, like, two or three... Or no, there's, like, one written review of it on IMDb. It has nine votes on IMDb. I think there's, like, one or two YouTube comments. No one's ever written a formal review of the film. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of, kind of funny, but... Um, They're still working on it. They're still trying to dissect it. still working, it. yeah. It was... Uh, it's it's a it's a hard. We're still waiting for exactly the right person to show up. Uh, we're we're um um. They're still waiting for the right word to describe your movie. <laughs> yeah, and and I think Blake um Blake's gonna be a really interesting guy to have on because he's he's just he comes from such a different cultural background than I think either you or I have. Like he's he works in this hardware store that his like parents have owned for three generations mm -hmm. in this town with like less than ten thousand people in it. Um and somehow he ended up like kind of making his way to the indie film circuit. So you know, good for him. But mm -hmm. uh yeah, this should be a, a fun but he's living in Fox News country, basically. So it'll be an interesting report from the other side. Side, I suppose. <laughs> or not, not the other. I mean, I, I don't think he's like in for the Fox News stuff, but just I, I feel like what reality looks like in Missouri right now is going to look a lot different than what reality looks like in, in my apartment in Boston right now. <laughs> Dan, is there any place that looks like your apartment in Boston? I mean, the a domicile. You know, set. Well, that. <laughs> Yeah, this is like, I mean, my my apartment's kind of like verging on, on Pee Wee level. Oh, that, that was one last thing I want to say about Pee Wee Herman, is that his interior, like the interior of houses, or like any kind of interior set in his work, uh -huh. so, I mean, I guess pretty much we're just talking about his house in the beginning of Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and then the playhouse in Pee Wee's Playhouse, I can't think of, I don't think he has a house in Big Top Pee Wee, or like we see his room or whatever he's in he's really comfortable with a lot of visual busyness and chaos oh interesting which yeah, is really yeah. refreshing to me because a lot of movies um a lot of movies seem to take place in abnormally clean rooms <laughs> like houses where it doesn't really look like anybody lives there uh-huh where this is a mess yeah this is a mess this is clearly like the the home of a collector who has figured out that so long as he doesn't go with any girls to the drive-in he can keep buying back all his old toys <laughs> um so 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 that he can be the kid who leaves all his toys on the floor again. Right. <laughs> oh, and my my other thing is, and I posted this to, uh, I believe, Facebook today, um, fan theory. Cowboy Curtis from Pee-wee's Playhouse uh -huh. and Morpheus from The Matrix are, in fact, the same person. Now, I obviously, it's the same actor. Yeah, so you're saying it's not just the same actor, it's the same, they're the same person. Cowboy it, Curtis. The, they exist as altering, so, so right, so at the beginning of The Matrix, Lawrence Fishburne, a.k.a. Cowboy Curtis, a.k.a. Morpheus, comes up to Keanu Reeves after a night out clubbing and he says I got two pills 
do different colors, eat one of them. Yeah. And then Keanu Reeves, you know, he eats one of them. And then he ends up going on like a spree shooting at a bank. And he, you know, he starts kind of dating this woman who looks exactly like him. And, <laughs> you know, living in this underground ecstasy rave. I'm not really sure what's going on in the last two Matrix movies. But anyway, we never find out what would happen if he took the other pill. Mm -hmm. And I kind of noticed, like, there is a very slight physical resemblance between Keanu Reeves and Paul Rubens. <laughs> I oh, so you said if, he, if he takes the other pill, he wakes up in the playhouse. Oh, 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 okay. In the playhouse, there's a lot of things that are very automated, especially for 1986. Mm. Almost one might think as automated as the Matrix. So that that's my two cents. Right, and that's before before um, um, before any serious CGI. So before uh, before that space special Matrix move. Um, oh yeah, yeah, the the like the thing with the like 85 cameras all filming it at the same time or whatever yeah, yeah. Pee-wee's Playhouse comes before that's available. <laughs> oh, and Pee-wee's Playhouse has probably the first, the, the closest thing to a tablet computer that I've ever seen that early besides an Etch-a-Sketch. Mm. And the, the magic screen, you remember the magic screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he even has like a GPS system, right? He has Globy. Whoa! He has, he's basically living in a smart home, but personalized. Uh, wow. So that's beyond what we have now oh yeah no no i mean we i feel like you know, like the western civilization may peak and crash before we all get our own playhouse but but if it doesn't no, crash if it doesn't crash that's what we're all shooting for all that is fully automated luxury gay space communism that is the dream <laughs> and that's what uh deep down inside all of you know that you deserve <laughs> um, on that hopeful inspiring note <laughs> shall we oh yeah all right so this has been dan and this has been ron and this has been anomaly questionable movies all and, right take uh, care. today we took a big adventure Woohoo! all right take care everyone all right later